Hello everyone, welcome to session 12 of LTech 676. I want to start off by saying I think you honestly hit a home run with Critical Reflection 7. Collectively, I think this is one of the strongest collections of reflections I have seen in a while. Your posts were thoughtful and nuanced and really spoke to the complexity of the relationship between education and technology and society. Of course, this week's assignment asked two heavy questions. One, do you think education is tasked with solving problems that are far beyond its reach? Why or why not? And two, do you think educational technology makes it more or less likely for education to solve such problems? Why or why not? This week's synthesizers, Madeline and Keisha, provided some really helpful summaries of the class's thoughts on these big questions. Madeline noted that the class overwhelmingly responded yes to the first question, arguing that in one way or another, education can and does contribute to solving larger societal problems, but it cannot be expected to act alone, especially considering how under-resourced and overtasked school systems are. Keisha echoed this sentiment, noting that while education can play a significant role in molding the ideal society, the issues that exist outside the classroom are so complex they cannot be ignored and must be addressed in other ways. As to the second question, which asked whether technology makes it more or less likely for education to solve such problems, responses were much more mixed. I think Elisa summarized it beautifully by suggesting it depends on whether you're viewing technology as a tool or as a panacea. In short, this is great work Thank you, everyone. Let's move on. I want to get started by talking about a 2019 book titled Black Software. This book is written by Dr. Charlton McIlwin. He's a professor of media, culture, and communication at NYU, and he's the founder of the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. But in Black Software, McIlwin draws on the simultaneous rise of the civil rights movement and the computer revolution starting in the 1960s. And he chronicles the long relationship between African Americans, computing technology, and the internet. He examines how computing technology has been used to neutralize the threat that black people pose to the existing racial order. And he centralizes African Americans' role in the internet's creation and evolution, illuminating both the limits and possibilities for using digital technology to push for racial justice in the United States and across the globe. So really interesting given some of the themes of this course. Another interesting current events is the announcement of some quote-unquote dismal reading scores. This was talked about in the New York Times, and the article is essentially about the results of the 2019 National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the NAEP. I know many of you in education are familiar with that. Now, what did we learn from these assessment results? Well, the nation's math scores remained relatively flat. However, our fourth and eighth graders are losing ground in their ability to read literature and academic texts. More specifically, only 35% of fourth graders are proficient in reading, and that's down from 37% in 2017. In addition, only 34% of eighth graders were proficient in reading, and again, that's down from 36% in 2017. Analysis of the eighth grade students' results shows that students in the top 10% percent lost only one point relative to the 2017 scores. Students in the middle lost three points on average. However, students in the bottom 10 percent lost six points. So again, we have to ask ourselves, are things getting better or are things getting worse? And of course, the article notes that school district leaders and education advocates said the steep losses among the lowest performing students reflected structural barriers beyond schoolhouses. 
Of course, that ties into this idea of the structural inequalities that we've been talking about this semester. And I just want to draw you back. I think this was from week seven. We talked about where are we today, Sutton summarized where we are educationally in terms of inputs, processes, and outcomes in 1991. Warshower defined where we are in 2010. And of course, these NAEP scores are helping us understand where we are today. And I would remind you of the question, how are new technologies affecting relative inequalities as measured by inputs, processes, and outcomes? And of course, we can think about the 2019 NAEP results as outcomes. I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but there is another interesting story in the New York Times related to AI. The title, of course, is We Teach AI Systems Everything, Including Our Biases. And in short, this article acknowledges that many AI systems learn from lots and lots of digitized information, such as old books, Wikipedia entries, and news articles. Basically, the author is saying that as a result of drawing on that digitized information, decades and even centuries of biases, along with the new ones in the programming, are probably baked into the results of these AI systems. And the article warns that as new, more complex AI moves into an increasingly wide array of products, tech companies are being pressured to guard against the unexpected biases that are being discovered. And of course, this raises important questions about trust, verification, and responsibility. So feel free to check that article out if you're interested. Okay, so let's get back to Christo Sims and disruptive fixation. This is tying to theme four. Of course, Critical Reflection 7 was all about outsized expectations and this idea or this critical question as to whether or not public education is tasked with problems that are far beyond its reach and whether technology makes it more or less likely that we can achieve the goals of education. Let's come back to disruptive fixation. Now, Sims points out that over and over again, essentially every decade, there are calls for education reform. And he talks about the 1983 publication, A Nation at Risk. Another example is the 2005 National Academy of Sciences publication titled Rising Above the Gathering Storm, which argues that U.S. students are falling further and further behind their international rivals and that this threatens the nation's supremacy as well as citizens' future for employment chances. And Sims points out that there's actually at least two dominant strands of education reform. On the one hand, we have traditional pedagogic reformers, and on the other hand, we have progressive pedagogic reformers. And both of these groups are arguing that because schools are broken and failing to fulfill their democratic purpose, that we need to fix them. And traditional pedagogic reformers value an established body of curricular content. They view students as passive receivers of knowledge and culture. They position teachers and media as transmitters of knowledge and culture. And they emphasize ends over means in other words, outcomes, and they prefer tightly scripted activities. You can sense from these bullet points that there is an emphasis on everyone being the same. On the other hand, we have progressive pedagogic reformers, and they emphasize caring for the whole child. They want to leverage in students' inherent creativity and unique interests, needs, and domains of familiarity. They value learners' active involvement in the processes of learning and the production of culture. And they emphasize the means, the inputs, and the processes, not just the outcomes. Now, I'm sure all of you tend to be more familiar with or lean towards one of these strands of education reform. And according to Sims, your particular point of view doesn't necessarily matter. Both sets of reformers are trying to do good, and they use the failure of the other set of reformers as a regenerative force. And essentially, he uses the comparison of a pendulum swinging back and forth between these two strands of education 
education reform. And he argues that one reform project's inability to fix problems that are beyond its reach becomes part of the ground from which another project's processes of problemization and rendering technical spring forth. And Sims argues, regardless of which particular approach to reform takes root at a given place and moment, the idealization of educational disruption as a, if not the, means to realize more extensive social and political yearnings lives on. Sims also talks about recent reform trends in the U.S. And he notes that the dominant trend in educational reform in the U.S. since the 1980s has been, one, centralizing control over educational agendas, while two, decentralizing responsibility for how those agendas should be carried out to local school officials and families, and three, implementing market-like conditions that promote choice for families and competition among schools and students. Four, they tend to rely on standardized metrics that would supposedly make educational outcomes intelligible to centralized authorities as well as families. And here's the connection to educational technology. And they tend to deploy new information technologies that would facilitate the capture, aggregation, and flow of metrics about performance upward to managers as well as outward to consumers. And so let's step back for a minute and think about what is the role of technology in enhancing or hindering these reform trends in the United States? And of course, like any technology, we can ask ourselves, are there unintended consequences and are any of these Faustian bargains that we should be considering? Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.